Okay, going to talk about uh, orthopedic trauma in this uh, PowerPoint. Uh, break it up into a few different uh, lecture files. So here are objectives. Um, firstly, to understand the assessment and basic management of fractures. To understand why some fractures do not heal, so-called non-unions, and we'll talk briefly about uh, why do fractures uh, not heal and what are some of the uh, ways we can get around that, and then to understand the complications and associated injuries that uh, present with fractures, especially things like uh, compartment syndrome, other you know, neurovascular injuries, and uh, how you can uh, stay out of trouble with those. So what is orthopedic trauma? Well, uh, it's the management of fractures and their related injuries, and whereas you know, fractures can occur, you know, in the hands and foot and ankle, and many fractures can be certainly ambulatory. If a patient has a fracture, they go uh, to urgent care or a hospital emergency department, perhaps, or a doctor's office, uh, and uh, they're ambulatory. They're not necessarily in the hospital, but a lot of times when we think about orthopedic trauma, we think about, uh, you know, sick patients in the hospital with uh, severe injuries. Uh, and overall, this includes the operative and non-operative care to help patients return to function after injury. All right. So I'm just going to outline some of the uh, sort of broad topics that we're going to cover in, in this uh, lecture, um, things you should know. So uh, extremity and uh, pelvic fractures, uh, associated neurovascular injury, compartment syndrome, open fractures and soft tissue injury, musculoskeletal infection, pathologic fractures, uh, which includes osteoporosis. A lot of times we don't really refer to osteoporosis or osteoporotic fractures as pathologic fractures, but by definition, pathologic fractures uh, does include them. So we'll kind of group them together a little bit. Fracture non-unions, splinting and casting principles, and basic surgical fixation principles. Just real basic stuff towards the end. So let's talk about fractures, and certainly anything about orthopedic trauma, this is mostly what we're talking about. Well, I'll go through some real basic anatomy and terminology stuff that we talked about uh, in second year. Uh, mechanisms, uh, evaluation of patients with fractures, uh, basic management, uh, both surgical and non-surgical. Certainly in this section of the talk, there's going to be a lot of review from uh, the uh, lecture uh, covered in your second year block. So definitely get familiar with some of the basic terminology, you know, proximal, uh, distal, uh, cancellous and cortical, um, the diaphysis of the bone, you know, which has the medullary canal, the metaphysis, uh, which is the trabecular uh, end, right, um, you know, both at the proximal and distal end, uh, and then the epiphysis, right, which is the articular surface. And uh, I guess in common clinical speak, you're not going to hear the term epiphysis used a whole lot. Um, we're going to usually talk about the articular surface uh, and the joint surface, uh, and in that way we'll be discussing the articular uh, epiphyseal end of the bone. So cortical bone is the compact bone. It makes up 80% of the skeleton. It has a high compressive bending and rotational strength. It has a slow turnover um, as opposed to cancellous bone, which is a spongy bone. Uh, comprises 20% of the skeleton. It's less dense and strong and has a high turnover rate. So by turnover, we mean that, uh, for instance, if you have a fracture, um, and uh, it breaks in the diaphysis. Uh, that's going to be, you know, cortical bone, perhaps a little slower to heal. It's going to take more energy to break that part of the bone. Um, whereas cancellous bone, more susceptible to fracture because it's less dense and strong. But when it does fracture, it's going to heal faster. Okay. And that's kind of some enhanced micrographs of perhaps what uh, you know, cortical bone would look like. Uh, you have these uh, tightly packed osteons versus uh, cancellous bone, which is more of a loose meshwork of trabecula. So 
Again, some definitions. Well, what are fractures defined? Well, firstly, I always like to say it's the same as being broken, quote unquote, because a lot of people sometimes make a distinction. Like, is it, you know, patients in particular, is it broken? Uh, is it fractured? Oh, I thought it was, I thought it was broken. I'm glad to hear it's only fractured. So it's really the same thing, okay? So a lot of times I think you need to make sure your patient is clear on that because uh, you may say one thing and they, they think it means something else, either better or worse. Um, so make it clear that a fracture is a break and it's essentially a disruption of the bone cortex, right? Uh, it can occur in any type of bone, you know, flat bones, long bones. Um, it can occur in any part of the bone, as we talked about, the uh, epiphysis, metaphysis, diaphysis. Uh, it can result in pain and loss of uh, related function, as you would imagine. So here's somebody with a femur fracture, uh, cannot facilitate motion, cannot provide structural support. Um, so uh, that's what bone is trying to do when it's completely disrupted, then those functions are lost. So what about mechanisms? Well, um, when a fracture occurs, there is essentially some type of mechanical failure of the bone under stress. Now this could be an axial loading or compression type injury. It can be a uh, rotation or a, a torsional type of an injury. Uh, it could be a bending injury and it could be a, um, a missile type injury, right? Um, either way, a um, fracture can occur uh, with one of these uh, mechanisms. Here we see that there is a uh, probably a bending type of an injury with a uh, butterfly fragment. So what about evaluation? Well, um, like anything uh, in, in medicine, uh, certainly in clinical medicine, everything starts with a history. And in orthopedics, there's really no, uh, um, you know, there's really no uh, exception here. Um, you need to uh, get a good clinical history. Um, you have to uh, move on to a physical examination. And certainly in orthopedics, physical examination is very important. It's not one of the disciplines where you sort of take a history and jump, jump right to uh, tests. Uh, but tests are important, especially uh, imaging, right? You're looking at, trying to look at bones, uh, radiographs, uh, CT scans, MRIs, etc. And we'll get into that. So history, frequently it's, there's going to be some trauma, right? Um, now, in some cases it may be atraumatic, but you want to elicit from the patient what happened. And sometimes if it's atraumatic, that can be important. If the patient has a fracture and there was no trauma, you have to start thinking, well, maybe there was some bone tumor or something. The patient was walking and suddenly the bone gives way or it just hurt a big crack. There's always going to be pain. Okay, so if the patient doesn't have pain, I mean, it sounds intuitive, but I mean, you know, most likely it doesn't have a fracture. Same thing on exam, like when you're examining a patient, and I'll get to that. Sometimes the patient will tell you they heard a crack or somebody heard a crack, and of course, there should be some immediate disability. So as opposed to somebody comes in and says, well, I don't know when it started hurting, it's been bothering me for a week, you know, this. something like that could be a stress fracture perhaps, and we're not going to get too much into that in this talk, um, but, um, you know, uh, the fracture that you normally think of um, is not going to occur uh, in some sort of vague uh, time frame. There's going to be an immediate disability. So on physical exam, you're going to certainly start with inspection, look for deformities, look for swelling, look for ecchymosis. Uh, you want to see if there's an open wound, perhaps, uh, with, uh, with the fracture seen. I would make it an open fracture like this one here. As I mentioned, you want to look for pain, right? So tenderness localized to the fracture site tenderness localized to the fracture site. This is really important because take an ankle injury for instance. Patient twists their ankle to come into the ER or office or whatever. If you have, if you can elicit bony tenderness on your exam, that is very suspicious. You know, now again, the ankle, it's, it's uh, you know, it could be fractured, it could be sprained. It has subcutaneous structures. You could pretty much put your finger, you know, pretty much right on skin and 
immediately underneath is bone on the medial malleolus or the lateral malleolus, for, for, for instance. It's a little bit harder to put your finger exactly on the tail or body, for instance, a lot more soft tissue in the way. But when you can confidently put your finger almost on top of bone and have tenderness, and the patient did not have any direct trauma to that area, somebody gets hit with a baseball on the forearm over the ulna, I mean, that's going to hurt when you press the ulna. But um, if the patient twisted their ankle, now have pain over the lateral malleolus and not just the ligaments, then you have to be concerned. So palpation is really important, especially, you know, with these type of injuries, they're somatic, it's a somatic pain. So as opposed to maybe an MI where a patient just kind of vaguely has pain, you know, maybe in the chest, maybe in the abdomen, maybe in the left shoulder. I mean, orthopedic pain is very, very low. It can be very localized. It's a somatic pain. There's instability. There's potentially painful range of motion near a joint and an impaired pulse, potentially. I mean, you have to look for this, at least. You're looking for circulation. You're looking for, um, you know, associated uh, injuries, perhaps. You want to get a detailed neurologic exam, right? So uh, you want to look for uh, sensation, reflexes, motor exam. You know, with sensation, of course, you can check both light touch, pressure, two-point discrimination is something that we also check for, particularly with suspected nerve injury in the hand. Uh, motor exam, you want to grade from one to five, right? So uh, one is no motion, five is good you know, motion and, uh, against resistance. So if I was checking someone's quadriceps, I would grade it from a, a motor strength of one to five. And um, as I'll get to later, these are things that you need to be very specific in your examination and potentially repeat examination. And when you come on around, you'll see how often we kind of like check this again and again every time we see the patients. All right, so um, I think I'll probably stop there. Um, and then we'll uh, pick up on the imaging and move ahead in the uh, next part of the talk. Thanks.